Hi, this is Lily DeHoyas Anderson, and you're listening to Choosing Glory. Thanks so much for joining me today. We're going to discuss Jacob 5 through 7, the last chapters of Nephi's brother, Jacob, another great prophet who worries about his people his entire life, which makes sense for these good men. I do want to thank all of you who are supporting me on Patreon. If you're interested, go to patreon.com forward slash choosing glory, and you can subscribe at one of the levels there. I am working to get Apple Premium content available for those who listen on Apple. That can be an easy way. However, it's been a little more complicated than I thought, so I am going to be available there soon. Had a lot of deadlines here coming up right around conference time, so I appreciate your patience, and your patience is... I want to start with actually chapter six in Jacob. We're going to do six, seven, and then end with five. Now, let's talk about the explanation here or the little subtitle that we get for this chapter, Jacob chapter six. The Lord shall recover Israel in the last days. Then the world shall be burned with fire. Men must follow Christ to avoid the lake of fire and brimstone. So this is the last day's warning, a warning of the Troubles to come before the second coming and how God will reach out again, as it says here in this chapter, that Christ will stretch forth his hands unto them all the day long. This is verse four, because of his great mercy and that he back in verse two, that he reaches or he shall set his hand again the second time to recover his people. So God doesn't give up on his people. He gives them multiple opportunities, but then the day comes when the judgments fall. So I think that's so relevant today. I think we have seen all kinds of warnings. Our prophet has told us that the time is running out, that this is the time where these signs and wonders are going to happen, great miracles, and yes, great destructions, as foretold in the preparation to the second coming of Christ. We've been talking about this a lot, how important it is for us to become a Zion people, to heed these warnings, to not be hard hearted or stiff necked or blind, but to actually watch so that we can be prepared. We don't have to be perfect and we don't have to be finished, but we do need to be diligently on that covenant path if we desire to be prepared for Christ's coming. So I wanted to talk about one of the signs. I'm going to be, I hope, sort of brief about this because we can really go down rabbit holes with these sorts of things. But brothers and sisters, we know that God uses many signs and wonders to show his works and to call his people. In Genesis, this is right there at the beginning of the Old Testament, right? Chapter 1, verses 14 through 19. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. So one of the reasons there are lights in the heaven is for signs when God chooses to talk to his people or to the world. And I have been looking at some interesting information about this eclipse that is coming on Monday, April 8th, which is the second total solar eclipse that they're calling like the Great American Eclipse because the path of totality is limited to the United States territories. So there are a lot of YouTube videos and lots of things online that you can look at. And honestly, some of them stretch a little bit. It seems like I'm not spending a ton of time on there, but I have listened to some because I I do believe that God speaks in these signs. Now, so just in case you haven't spent too much time with this, let me just review some basic things that we had an eclipse in the United States in 2017. And it passed over seven cities, the totality, the path of totality, which is about 130 miles wide, passed over seven cities named Salem. It began in Salem, Oregon, I believe. But anyway, over the path that it made across the United States, it crossed seven cities named Salem. Now, Salem is what? Well, it's a a word for peace. It comes from the Hebrew. I mean, it's related to... Jerusalem, it's related to the word shalom, which is a greeting for peace. So Christ is the prince of peace. And it's interesting that those things happen. It doesn't seem to me like that's just random. And then 
So what's the message? Maybe it could have been come to Christ. People have pointed out that the path of totality as it traveled over the United States was in the form of a Hebrew letter. That's the first letter of the alphabet, Aleph. And that this was kind of maybe the beginning, the beginning of the end, a, a last, you know, beginning for people to come to Christ. You can interpret in lots of ways, I suppose. This 2024 eclipse that will be on April 8th, the path of totality will pass over or very near, like some of them are not exactly on the path, but they're very close to seven cities in the United States that are named Nineveh. So I don't know. It doesn't seem to me like you can make this stuff up, but I find that to be pretty interesting. And now what would be the message of Nineveh? Well, we know that Jonah was sent to the city of Nineveh. It was an Assyrian capital and it was very wicked and that his call was to repent. So anyway, Christ is always calling us to repent. I don't think that's much of a stretch. The path that the totality makes on the map this time or will on April 8th creates the shape of the letter Toph, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And maybe this is one of the last signs or warnings that we need to repent. God's not kidding around. You know, it's it's interesting because what happens when people feel like God has delayed the fulfillment of his promises? And I was talking to my daughter, Faith, today, and she pointed this out, that she had been reading in the end of Helaman and the beginning of Third Nephi, where, of course, the sign is given of the birth of Christ, right? And they're about to kill all the believers because the sign hasn't been given. And look what it says there in the last chapter of Helaman, chapter 16. This is what Faith was talking about. That, well, let's look at verse 15. Nevertheless, the people began to harden their hearts, all save it were the most believing part of them both of the Nephites and also the Lamanites, and began to depend upon their own strength and their own wisdom, saying some things they may have guessed right among so many. In other words, they're talking about the prophets and the signs and the prophecies that have been given. Samuel the Lamanite and other prophets that warned about the need to repent. And they're saying, well, maybe they just guessed right on some of those signs among all the different possibilities. But behold, we know that all these great and marvelous works cannot come to pass of which has been spoken. So that's a very common response that people have to signs and wonders. Oh, it was just random. It must have been, you know, they got a few things right because there were so many options. They couldn't be wrong all the time. Later on in this chapter, very close to the end of Helaman, verse 21, again, talking about these witnesses, you know, we're not going to witness these things and believe they're true. And they will, by the cunning and the mysterious arts of the evil one, work some great mystery, which we cannot understand, which will keep us down to be servants to them. So in other words, or this is just manipulative, them talking about these great signs or using them as a way to say that they know what God wants is just a way to control other people. So that was kind of interesting, right? That they're are ways that people dismiss signs and wonders. Oh, it's they just guessed and they got a few things right. Or on the other hand, they're just using this to control us. And if we fall for it, then we're going to have to believe other things and they'll use us as servants or slaves or whatever. So there are a lot of ways that people dismiss signs and wonders. Or maybe we can look at them and say, this is a fulfillment of last time's prophecies, that there will be many marvelous signs and wonders in the heavens and in the earth. These eclipses are kind of interesting to me, but again, I'm always trying to keep a balance here and not go down a rabbit hole. You could spend your whole life looking at what people think the signs are, but I did want to mention a few other things about the eclipse. Although, even in our commentaries a lot, when it talks about how Christ says that there will be no other sign given but the sign of Jonas, meaning Jonah, many times it is suggested that he's talking about the three days that Jonas spent in the belly of the whale. And that was a similitude of Christ being in the tomb for three days and then rising up in resurrection. And it could be because there is certainly a parallel there. However, it has also been suggested. In fact, let me read this that I found online. Some Bible scholars speculate, bolstered by strong scientific and archaeological evidence, that Jonah's preaching at Nineveh coincided with the great Assyrian eclipse in 763 BC. This eclipse is chronicled in ancient Assyrian texts. So I found that interesting because they are suggesting that there was at least another sign of the prophet Jonah, which was that the sun was darkened by the great Assyrian eclipse. Now, can you imagine that actually 
you know, could be. And again, we don't have exact understanding of ancient history. We just don't have enough evidence. But the suggestion is interesting to me because Jonah knew how wicked the Assyrians were, and they were known for brutality and barbarism. In fact, in some of their palaces that were constructed in Nineveh later, they even would have adorning the palace walls depictions of their great victories and the great destruction that they wrought on their enemies. So that was pretty intimidating, right? They were a fierce, warlike people when they went to battle. You can see why Jonah was like, you know, they've wreaked havoc or wrought havoc against my people in the past. And eventually, of course, the Assyrians take the northern kingdom captive. And that is the end of the northern kingdom. The 10 tribes become lost at that point. So he was pretty intimidated and didn't want to go there. But after God not taking no for an answer, because he knows the people of Nineveh will repent, which is a surprise to Jonah. And I can understand why. But Jonah finally goes after the time with the whale and all that stuff. He's finally saying, okay, I will go and fulfill this calling that God has given me. And he goes to the capital city there of Nineveh. And it is suggested by these Bible scholars, as they say, bolstered by strong scientific and historical evidence, archaeological evidence, that his coming to that capital coincided with a total solar eclipse, which would be pretty impressive to the Assyrians. And when he said, you need to repent or God will destroy you, maybe that was one of the reasons that they responded so favorably because there was a sign and a wonder given and they weren't completely hardened and they decided we need to pay attention to this message and we'll soften our hearts and repent. So anyway, if we wanted to take these eclipses and as another opportunity to repent, how bad would that be? Interesting to me. Of course, we know that when Christ was crucified, we don't really think of that as an eclipse because it seems that the sun was darkened for maybe the three hours, the last three hours where Christ was on the cross, which is much longer than an eclipse lasts. So again, I'm not claiming to know all the details about this, but we do know that the sun was darkened and the earth shook and the tremors were such that even the very pagan Roman centurions and guards said, surely this man was the son of God. So they were not so hardened that they couldn't see the signs for what they were. Let's make sure that our hearts are softened. And it's not about becoming superstitious or creating a whole new cult thing or cult-like following about this. But on the other hand, God gives us signs and wonders that depict his seasons, his years, and so on. And he wants us to pay attention and certainly to take away the message, which is to come to Christ, to be healed, and to repent and prepare. So I hope that we are asking the Lord, what does he want from us at this season, at this time that we can do to be part of the preparation for the coming of the Lord? Interestingly, that when the, they map out the crossing of the paths of totality of the 2017 and the 2024 solar eclipse, where those paths cross, and again, it's a 130 mile wide totality. So it's kind of a section of a few Midwest states. But where the center point of the crossing is, apparently it lands in a state park right on where it's indicated on the map, a road named Salem. Well, take it for what it's worth. I don't know if those are coincidences. So as Jacob says here in one of these terrific and succinct statements that he makes in Jacob chapter 6, verse 12, oh, be wise, what can I say more? That's a pretty good takeaway. Oh, be wise. What can I say more? Okay, Jacob 7. We're also going to talk fairly briefly about this, although a lot can be studied about Antichrists. So Sherem confronts Jacob, and Jacob confronts Sherem, who is going around teaching Antichrist doctrine. We Now, we just spent time talking about how important this doctrine of Christ is, that we should have faith in Christ, that we should repent, bring forth fruits of meat of repentance, be baptized, take upon us the name of Christ, and seek sanctification, having been confirmed with the power of the Holy Ghost, but seeking that constant companionship and the purification that comes with the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost, and then enduring to the end. So that is preparation for Christ's coming, is to pursue 
this doctrine of Christ and take it seriously and then dismiss the other voices that would interfere with that tremendous, simple, but powerful doctrine of Christ, which is to come to Christ with faith through repentance or making of our covenants and remaining diligent to those covenants. Sherem, of course, is teaching not the doctrine of Christ, but the doctrine of the devil. And we're going to look at that a little bit. So what does it say? Verse two here of Jacob seven, he preaches that there should be no Christ. Well, that is the ultimate message of an antichrist, that there should be no Christ. And then he preaches many things which were flattering unto the people. And this he did that he might overthrow the doctrine of Christ. There's a very clear agenda. He doesn't want people to repent. He doesn't want them to change. He wants them to blame somebody else for their problems. Again, that would be liberation theology, which is basically Marxism. Critical race theory, same thing, where it's all about oppressed and oppressor, and it's not your fault that you have problems. You know what? Sometimes it's not your fault that you have problems. There is such a truth that, you know, there is oppression in the world, and some people really, really act in terrible ways towards others. So this is not about exonerating victimizers, not one whip, but it is about not getting caught in that dogma that tells us it's always somebody else's fault and I don't have to do anything. We always have to do something if we want to follow Christ. And that something is to bring forth the ultimate sacrifice of a broken heart and a contrite spirit, which are manifest through our changing, our repentance, becoming a better version of ourselves, learning to do better, you know, whatever thou art, as David O'McKay read on his Scottish mission, act well thy part. There are a lot of simple ways to put this. And of course, it's a lifetime of learning to keep trying to come to Christ and let him keep helping us find that better version of ourselves where we become more like he is, a little more purified, a little more holy. Well, Sharon doesn't want anybody to do that. So he's going to try to teach the people the opposite of the doctrine of Christ. He wants to overthrow the doctrine of Christ. Now notice in verse four about Sherem, he was learned that he had perfect knowledge of the language of the people, wherefore he could use much flattery and much power of speech according to the power of the devil. And he even wants to shake Jacob from the faith, it says in verse five, even though Jacob is full of revelation and the spirit. But let's, let's look at this for a second. And that was reminding me when it talks about that he had this power of learning that, you know, some people really do have kind of a gift of oratory. I remember having a young client years ago who was a college student and he mentioned that and he said, people believe what I say. He said, I can really convince people easily. So he said, but I'm not sure why I have that gift. And he had some struggles with the gospel. And so he was cautious about that because he said, I know people tend to believe me if I teach a lesson or if I'm just talking with friends or in a group of people. Anyway, some of us do have gifts that allow us to be persuasive or maybe easily believed by others. And there's such a big responsibility with that. I was reminded of a time when our family was camping out at the beach in California with some family friends who had access to Camp Pendleton. So we were having a great time there with these dear friends of ours and in our tent trailer or whatever. Anyway, a lot of campfires on the beach and so on as we stayed several days. And one night we were playing the game Mafia. I don't know if you, you know, you have to convince people that you're either a good guy or a bad guy and then they vote. Well, Chris was a good guy. He drew the, the card or whatever of being a good guy. And I was one of the mafia members. Like I was supposed to be a bad guy. But then you get a chance to talk to people and try to persuade them so that they'll vote you as a good guy or whatever. And anyway, Chris very sincerely was saying that he was a good guy. And I very insincerely, I mean, it was a game, but I tried to make the point that I was a good guy, even though I wasn't in the game. And they believed me and voted me innocent and Chris guilty. And I remember Chris saying, I am never playing this game again, because even when I tell the truth, people don't believe me. And when you don't tell the truth, people believe you. And, you know, it was a sobering moment because I think sometimes I have that gift too. And I told this young man about that game. And I said, you know, 
what could this mean except that we have such a terrific responsibility to speak truth? Do I ever make mistakes? Of course I do. I think back on things that I probably taught in the past that I really believed, but that over the years I've come to understand better or more fully or differently. And I, you know, try to upgrade constantly. I mean, we upgrade our software, right? And to keep learning and keep growing and keep changing to a more accurate understanding of the plan of salvation and the gospel principles and the doctrine. But I take that ownership. I take that responsibility because if we do have the power to even invite people to think of some things or certainly persuade or that maybe we are easily believed, we had better be really careful about our content and never use it to, to hurt others or to do what Sharam does. He has the learning, he has this perfect understanding of the language, and he uses it in a really, really evil way. What a day of accountability he comes up against in his dealings with Jacob that ultimately lead in his death. Now, I don't want to get into the weeds of the details because the story is pretty straightforward, but I want to mention a few things about the Antichrist. Now, this is the first of three prominent Antichrists that we know by name. It doesn't mean these are the only Antichrists, but these are, are the three most you know famous and specifically named Antichrists in the Book of Mormon. We're going to encounter, of course, two others as we go. But right now with Sherem, let's just mention a few things. I talked to my son Harper about this because he has made a big study of the Antichrist in the Book of Mormon, and it was fun to talk to him and see some of the things he's written about it. So I'm just going to share a few things. This is from 2 Thessalonians. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now, this refers to Antichrist in general, but it could refer to that final Antichrist that's prophesied in the book of Revelation that will come in the last days. One more verse from 2 Thessalonians, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of truth that they might be saved. So this is why we talk so much in this podcast about the warnings that we have against sophistry, against the power of the devil to make unsound and misleading, but clever and plausible and subtle arguments to try to persuade people against the doctrine of Christ. Right now, there is so much sophistry. There are, and I would suggest that we're not talking about just like a single character all the time, but even philosophies or ideas that are rampant in our society. And the Bible dictionary also that Harper pointed out to me says, in a broader sense, an antichrist is anyone or anything that counterfeits the true plan or the true gospel or plan of salvation, and that openly or secretly is set up in opposition to Christ. Well, that's pretty clear. So when we are hearing things opposite the message of repentance, when we are hearing, no, you're fine the way you are, there's not going to be a Christ, there's not going to be a judgment, all dogs are going to heaven, like all those things are sophistry, and they are antichrist philosophies and the people who are spouting them are telling them it doesn't matter how you live the gospel you get to choose you get to choose how you get you know honor the sabbath day you get to choose what it means to expose yourself to materials or media you get to choose what you wear or if you wear your garments you you get to choose you do what you want this is antichrist doctrine this is this is an antichrist message so it's really important for us to be aware and to help our children understand that that messages, any of those things, anyone or anything that counterfeits the true gospel or the plan of salvation. And we talk a lot about critical thinking, which is also so important. And again, just remembering again, what I've mentioned before, Aristotle's statement, it is the mark of an educated mind, or I would say a critical thinker to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. I mean, this isn't requiring us to, you know, say like, no, I won't listen. I'm not going to listen to anything else. I, I'm not, I don't hear you. I mean, we can hear and listen. Certainly we don't want to expose ourselves to really evil stuff. And if we know it's not good, we should stay away from it. But when it comes to talking to people, we don't have to be afraid of hearing somebody's opinions or their discussion about something if they are earnest and honest about it. But we need to be able to entertain a thought without automatically accepting it. You know, how gullible are we? 
how easily convinced are we of sophistry or anybody's argument just because they may have that same gift that Sharon had. And that sometimes some of us have where we can persuade people or we can use the language in useful ways. To that statement by Aristotle, a man named Mark Manson, and I'm not familiar with him, but he's a New York Times bestselling author, but I liked this because he quoted that Aristotle statement, which again is it is a mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. And he adds this, being able to look at and evaluate different values without necessarily adopting them is perhaps the central skill required in changing one's own life in a meaningful way. That's a really good thought. I, I, I like it. Being able to look at and evaluate different values without necessarily adopting them is perhaps the central skill required in changing one's own life in a meaningful way. So I talked to Harper about this, but we're not going to do it right now. We are going to do some extra content and discuss the Antichrist of the Book of Mormon, but that will be coming up later as we have a couple of other big names coming up in the, in this category so that's not coming really quickly. I have some other things I have to post first, and then I will get to it eventually as we move forward. Then I do want to talk briefly about Jacob 5. This is, of course, is it the longest? I didn't look it up, but I think it's the longest chapter in the Book of Mormon. <laughs> it's pretty lengthy. And this is that allegory of the of the Lord of the Vineyard and you know how he's trying to bring forth good fruit and he keeps having trouble with the trees and they get top lofty, which of course makes sense to us because that's pride, but he works with his servant and, you know, sometimes he gets pretty distressed, you know, I should just chop it all down, or burn it or whatever. And he's like, well, let's try again. Let's, let's prune it and dung it and, you know, do everything we can. He transplants and then he plants back and whatever. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because there are, some good videos and there's a lot of good commentary on this, but I did want to make this point. One of my French cousins, that is a French American cousin, because my mother and her sister, these two French sisters with their mother, my grandmother came to this country and all stayed faithful to the church. And my aunt Renee had six children. So those are my French American cousins. And one of them, Maurice, spoke at my aunt's funeral many years ago. And he was actually studying at the time the first volume of my mother's personal history. And he read some things from that history because it was tough. It was a tough beginning of life for my mother and her sister and very tough for my grandmother. So I wanted to give a little tribute to them because Maurice made a nice tie-in with Jacob 5. And what he said was this. He was quoting from Jacob 5. Yes, this is the long chapter, so... I'm having to turn back a few pages. There we go. Verse 21. Came to pass that the servant said unto his master, How comest thou hither to plant this tree or this branch of the tree? For behold, it was the poorest spot in all the land of thy vineyard. And then in verse 23, just a couple of verses later. Well, actually, I'm going to read 22 also. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto him, Counsel me not. I knew that it was a poor spot of ground. Wherefore, I said unto thee, I have nourished it this long time, and thou beholdest that it has brought forth much fruit. Verse 23, and it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, Look hither, behold, I have planted another branch of the tree also, and thou knowest that this spot of ground was poorer than the first. But behold, the tree I have nourished it this long time, and it hath brought forth much fruit. So my cousin Maurice, I thought, made a, a lovely point, and that was that while this applies to many people in their experience in life, it certainly applied to our mothers and to our grandmother on this French side. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about the poor spot of the vineyard where they, they were planted. My grandmother had tough parents. In fact, there's some suspicion that her mother for a while ran a brothel. I don't have the final evidence on that, but one of my cousins is fairly convinced. And she's done a lot of family history in that arena. At any rate, they were not Catholic. And I do have this from my French grandmother's own words. She lived with us when I was growing up. So I, I knew her very well. We called her Meme, which is kind of the nickname for grandma in, in France. And I asked her once to write her personal history. And in that, she mentioned that they weren't Catholic when almost everybody in France was Catholic. 
Now that doesn't mean they were all super believing Catholics, but they were, you know, they used to go to mass. There was a lot of, you know, societal encouragement to be Catholic then. So and they all have to had to have Catholic saints' names as a first name. That was a French law. So anyway, it was a Catholic country for sure. And she mentions in the history that she wrote that they weren't Catholic. But when she was in school, just as a, you know, she never went past secondary. So I don't know exactly what grade she was in. But when she was at school, a neighbor and friend from school gave her a Bible. And she read it. And she says that she had the sense of having known it before. So she was a believing woman. She believed in God. And when she read the Bible, she recognized the truthfulness of it, even coming from a home where they didn't have a Bible and they didn't go to church or identify as Catholic at all. And we're pretty nasty people. I won't go into details, but there, there are some stories about how tough it was for my grandmother growing up because her parents were not loving or kind or soft, but she was. She had a younger brother that she was almost old enough to be sort of a surrogate mother to, and she loved him dearly and talked to him about God. And the two of them believed that he was killed in World War I in a kind of meaningless battle, taking a hill that kept being transferring control from the Germans to the French and back. But she knew when he died and felt that he sent her a message spiritually that he was okay and that he was happy. And later they got the message that indeed he had died really at the moment that she knew that. And so that was always a tragedy for her because that was probably the closest relationship she had in her family of origin. And then she loses him. She had an arranged marriage the first time that man died and then she married a widower, and that was my biological grandfather. And she had these two daughters, my mother and my Aunt Renee, in reverse order. My mother was the younger, but they were very close in age. And they were poor, and their father was a terrible guy. He was abusive emotionally, verbally, physically. He, he actually joined the church. They all joined the church. He found a missionary, or the missionaries found them, and he liked that missionary, so he, they did get baptized, but it never took for my grandfather. Later on, they offered him the milk because it appreciated at some point, and he said, no, I'm fine. You know, I mean, he didn't understand, and it never changed any of his behavior. He was always into get-rich-quick schemes, and they never worked, so my grandmother ended up always having some sort of business that kind of supported them, but then my grandfather would try to take over the business and offend everybody and ruin it, and so she was always having to scramble. And then when Hitler was doing his European broadcasts, my grandfather was a big fan. He really liked what he was hearing by Adolf Hitler. And my grandmother and many others in France could see the war coming. It was not really hard to see that Hitler was becoming very aggressive and so my grandmother realized that if he came, Hitler came and conquered France, that my grandfather would be a collaborator. And that destroyed families when the native people joined with the Nazis to persecute their own people. So she was very prayerful. And, and Heber J. Grant had come to Paris and invited everybody to come to Zion in Utah anyway. So they had traveled from Orient to Paris and they had heard Heber J. Grant. And so she used that to try to convince my grandfather and other things to leave. Now they couldn't get visas to the United States. So they were able finally to get visas to Argentina and Argentina was giving very, very poor farmland to Europeans that would resettle there. And many of them did. So they got on a giant boat and we have one picture of my mother on this huge boat and they traveled to South America and they settled in Neuquén, which is kind of south of Buenos Aires. And it was, one of our sons, Dominic, served his mission in Buenos Aires South, and he actually traveled to Neocan, and he said, I can't even imagine what it would have been like in the 40s. He said it was an armpit when I was there, so no offense intended, but it was a tough place to farm, and they had no indoor plumbing, no indoor kitchen. I mean, it was really primitive. But my mother learned to love the animals, and when she was 16, my grandfather was getting so much more abusive that she went to her mother and said, we need to leave. And he wouldn't have let them go because they were doing all the work. So they had to make a plan to leave sneakily and to, to leave when he wasn't aware. And that took a lot of planning and some miracles, which I won't get into now, but some really amazing stories about how they prayed that they would be able to be successful at that and leave him with a little money so that he wouldn't be completely 
without resources when they left, but they were able to leave. They went to Buenos Aires, and that was the first time they were ever around an organized ward and mission of the church. In France, they had been in such a small area that there was a little branch, but really there were like five people, usually including the missionaries. I guess that's not true because their family was four, but anyway, seven or eight people maybe, including the missionaries. And they went to Neoken where there weren't missionaries, there was no organized part of the church. But when they went to Buenos Aires, there was a mission there. And they went to the mission president, who was a man from the United States, and they asked him, is this far enough or will he find us? And that blessed, wonderful mission president said, I'll find out. And he started fasting and praying. And he came back to them and he said, this is far enough. He will come to Buenos Aires to look for you, but he won't find you. You'll be safe here. So their new life began. Now they had nothing. My mother and aunt had not had time to finish their secondary schooling. So they had nothing like a high school graduation. And they had to go to work in the factories. My grandmother, who had been, had taken a brunt of a lot of the abuse as well, was, had kind of went through a little bit of a, of a collapse. She cooked for them and shopped and so on, but she wasn't in a position where she could find work. But my mother and aunt went to work and they made pennies, basically. But little by little, under my grandmother's wise tutelage, they became trained for better and better jobs at the factory. When they had a break, they would go and observe somebody who was getting paid more. They would learn that skill. And when an opening came, they were already prepared to take it. Eventually, they saw that the girls in the office made the best income and they were in the most fortunate circumstances. So they went to the library and they got books and they learned how to type on a library book page and they learned shorthand from books at the library. Eventually, my mother knew shorthand in three languages and worked in the French embassy in Montevideo where they, when they moved to Uruguay. And then the, just as they had, I mean, they saved pennies. Again, I asked them how poor they were. I asked my mother when I was in high school, how poor were you? And she told me what they ate. And it was it was terrible. I mean, the level of poverty from one generation to the next had changed so dramatically. So anyway, why do I tell you this story? I could go on and I won't, but it really hit me with great tenderness when my cousin Maurice said that our mothers were planted in the poorest part of the vineyard. When it comes to resources or access to resources or the support of church organizations, or even having a Bible in the home when my grandmother was growing up and her parents were non-believers and terrible people. And then, you know, that my own grandfather that I never met because he went back to France and my mother would never let him get close to us. But it was astonishing how much fruit they brought forth. My sisters and I and all my cousins on the other French family are all active. Almost all the grandchildren are active. It's extraordinary, brothers and sisters, how much good fruit has come from that transplant into the poorest part of the vineyard. And I guess I just want to testify of the Lord's ways. They can be mysterious. They can be tough. But the goal is always to bring forth fruit so that we can flourish ultimately in a spiritual sense and eternally we can forever be with our Heavenly Father and our Savior Jesus Christ if we continue to bring forth the fruit that is asked of us, which he helps us to bring forth. Life is, is fascinating. <laughs> But what a great perspective here in Jacob 5. Now, I just want to share a couple of things. Jeffrey R. Holland, and this is from verse 41 in Jacob 5, which is one of those heart-wrenching verses that we know of, right? What could I have done more for my vineyard? Here's the whole verse. It came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard wept and said unto the servant, what could I have done more for my vineyard? Well, Elder Holland refers to this in a speech called The Grandeur of God, October 2003. There in the midst of a grand vision of humankind, which heaven opened to his view. Now, he, sorry, he's shifting here to Enoch. Okay, this is from the book of Moses. Observing both the blessings and challenges of mortality, sometimes being in the poorest part of the vineyard. He turns his gaze toward the father and is stunned to see him weeping. He says in wonder and amazement to this most powerful being in the universe, 
how is it that thou canst weep? Thou art just and merciful and kind forever. Peace is the habitation of thy throne, and mercy shall go before thy face and have no end. How is it thou canst weep? Looking out on the events of almost any day, God replies, Behold, these thy brethren, they are the workmanship of mine own hands. And I gave unto them a commandment that they should love one another and they should choose me their father. But behold, they are without affection and they hate their own blood. Wherefore should not the heavens weep, seeing these shall suffer? That single riveting scene does more to teach the true nature of God than any theological treatise could ever convey. It also helps us understand much more emphatically that vivid moment in the Book of Mormon allegory of the olive tree, when after digging and dunging, watering and weeding, trimming, pruning, transplanting and grafting, the great Lord of the vineyard throws down his spade and pruning shears and weeps, crying out to any who can listen, what could I have done more for my vineyard? What an indelible image of God's engagement in our lives. What anguish in a parent when his children do not choose him, nor the gospel of God, that doctrine of Christ that is such a precious gift. How easy to love someone who so singularly loves us. In his life and especially in his death, Christ was declaring, this is God's compassion I am showing you, as well as that of my own. In the perfect son's manifestation of the perfect father's care, in their mutual suffering and meaning, in the declaration, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Elder Holland concludes, I bear personal witness this day of a personal living God who knows our names, hears and answers our prayers, and cherishes us eternally as children of his spirit. I testify that amidst the wondrously complex tasks inherent in the universe, he seeks our individual happiness and safety above all other godly concerns. Let me repeat that. Amidst the wondrously complex tasks inherent in the universe, he seeks our individual happiness and safety above all other godly concerns. So I wanted to share a personal experience here recently. And sometimes I tell stories with too much detail, so I'm going to try to keep this one short. I have a lot of mountains to move right now. There are just a lot of tasks that ensue the loss of a partner and a spouse. And, you know, we didn't have any warnings. So there are some things that are more complicated than they might have otherwise been. And I could list them and I won't because <laughs> you don't need to hear them. But really, I feel like there are several huge and relatively burdensome items that are on my desk right now, so to speak, and that I need to move forward in. And I pray over all of it, but it's hard. And as I've mentioned in the past, and I've even heard from some of you that this has been your experience too, that you start out with lists of things and some of them look like they could be accomplished pretty quickly and hopefully in a straightforward and not too complex way. But no, that one item become, becomes five items because before you can get that done, you have to do this and this and this, and you know, then this is attached to it and whatever. And that has been happening again as these little, some of them I thought were molehills have become mountains because they're more complex and demanding than I had understood or hoped. And it's burdensome and wearying and it feels overwhelming sometimes. I'm chopping away at it and, uh, and I am seeing some of these tasks get accomplished. There remain some other really big ones, but at any rate, a couple of weeks ago, I was having to run some errands and I had loaded up the car with some things I needed to take and I was a little time sensitive. So I, I was ready to jump in the car and I didn't have the key in the pocket. I thought I'd put it in the key to the car. So I'm like, oh, darn, I really thought I had that. But I ran back in the house and went to the jar or the it's a kind of a special dish where we keep the keys to the car and we have two keys for each car. Well, there wasn't another key to that car. <laughs> There wasn't any key. And I'm like, oh my goodness, we have two keys. So 
and the one isn't in my pocket that I thought. So like, and then I lost the other one. Anyway, it was kind of like frustrating and I did have to go. So I searched more carefully and I had thrown a jacket on. And instead of putting the key in my jeans pocket, I had put it in the jacket pocket where I don't usually, anyway, that was not too hard. I found a key. So I was able to go and do my errands, but in the back of my mind was like, where's that other key? I don't carry a purse. So I always have pockets and I, I couldn't imagine it falling out and I'm really careful that I'm doing my pockets at night so I can put things away. And I'm like, anyway, I couldn't really think about it as I was running the errands, but it was sort of in the back of my mind that that just made me kind of uneasy because you really want to have a spare key. So that evening I was back at my computer and that thought crossed my mind again that like, oh, I, I don't know where that other key is. And I thought, I'm just going to make this simple. I'm just going to buy another key. Like they're not super cheap, but you know, hopefully they're not too expensive either. And I thought, I'm just going to buy one so that I don't have to worry about this. Like I just don't need another thing to worry about or to feel vulnerable about. So I just was going to reach for my keyboard and Google that key for that car. And I didn't even touch the keyboard. I've talked to some people and they've said they've had a similar experience. This had never happened to me before. I mean, the Lord has helped me find things, but never this way. There was almost like a vision. It was this clear picture in my mind. It was very quick. So it was like a flash of a vision, but I saw where the key was. I saw it. And it wasn't like check here, or it might be here. It was here is where the key is. And sure enough, it was there. And I didn't even go up right then to get it because I just was so sure I knew the key was there. Now I wept a little bit at my desk because I was grateful for that, that little mercy that I knew where the key was now, but I was also, this was a strange feeling to have this juxtaposition of, I know where the key is. And I'm so grateful that the Lord is mindful of me. Just as Elder Holland was saying, he cares, but he knows our names. He's mindful of us. So he showed me where the key was, and that was tender, and I was touched by it and grateful. And then there was a part of me that was irritated at the same time. <laughs> it was like, I have all these mountains to move, and I know the Lord can move mountains, but instead he's showing me where the key is. <laughs> and I felt like, really? <laughs> I mean, really, Lord, thank you for this little miracle, but I have some you know, I feel like I've got Pharaoh's army coming down on me and the Red Sea is right in front of me. And anytime you want to part, even a little segment of this Red Sea would be really appreciated. But at least now I know where my key is. <laughs> and then sure enough, when I did go, it went right to where the key was and it's now back in the dish where it belongs. But brothers and sisters, it made me really think about, and I of course have thought about this many times in many contexts, but I thought about how I have these two tracks. I think I've mentioned them before. I'm on two roads at the same time. One of those roads is my, and I am overwhelmingly grateful for this, that my knowledge of God, my knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the great blessings and promises that are ours if we obey and follow his son, Jesus Christ and are diligent in keeping our covenants. I'm so grateful for that knowledge that I can trust him, that I know his ways are just and merciful and that he has a plan for each of us and it's perfect. But the other track that I'm on is the experiential track where sometimes I'm hurt. Sometimes I'm bereft. I can be so overcome with grief and sorrow. And those two tracks are always ongoing right now. And I, and I can feel the dissonance between them. I want that gap to close, but I thought about Joseph Smith and Liberty Jail in section 121. Because boy, if I feel like I have a knowledge of God and a trust in him, how much did the prophet know God? He had seen him and the Savior Jesus Christ when he was a young boy and had had angels and the ministering of angels all along as he translated the Book of Mormon and throughout the restoration that was an ongoing restoration. So many miracles. He had that knowledge that was profound and deep and immovable. And yet there was this other experiential track where Joseph Smith also cried out, Oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? 
I was comforted by that. I was comforted that I'm not the only one that knows something about God and still feels sometimes hurt or confused or has some dissonance that I know it's all going to turn out okay, but right now it's all about faith. And I know that God is doing a work in this process. I can't tell you exactly what it is, but I know it has something to do with refinement. It has something to do with my benefit. And that's again what President Holland said, Elder Holland said, he seeks our individual happiness. So, well, let me go back again. Amidst the wondrously complex tasks inherent in the universe, God seeks our individual happiness and safety above all other godly concerns. I do trust that even when it doesn't feel that way. I testify of this, brothers and sisters. We come to the end of another marvelous prophet's testimony in the Book of Mormon. What can I say? Be wise. What can I say more? And to be wise is to be obedient. We know that. Another prophet will testify of that in the coming days as we study the Book of Mormon. I love the Lord. I do trust him, even when I hurt. Let's choose glory. Let's trust him. Let's build Zion. There are signs and wonders happening, brothers and sisters. Let's not be foolish. Let's not dismiss them. Let's not be afraid. Let's redouble our efforts and pray to the Lord about how we can prepare. As ever, thanks to my wonderful husband, Chris Anderson, and Doug Larson of Point Digital. Take care.